welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. This is yet another uh, video from the EM Rapid 2023, and today we'll be talking about acute kidney injury, and I'm Dr. Sapa Ali. So let's begin. So what do we know about acute kidney injury? It's the deterioration of renal function that happens over a period of hours or days which leads to accumulation of toxic wastes in the body and, and ultimately destroys or affects the internal homeostasis of the body. Now, as we study, there are two major kinds of acute kidney injury that is community acquired and hospital acquired. What we commonly see is the community acquired acute kidney injury where patients land up with volume depletion, uh, secondary to sepsis, burns or pancreatitis or excessive vomiting, diarrhea, as we will, you know, like study about them further. So most of the reversible causes and the ones that we commonly encounter uh, uh, is the acute, community acquired acute kidney injury uh, with the uh, rates of about 55 to 79% of incidence of patients presenting with acute kidney injury fall under the umbrella of community acquired renal insult. Now, hospital acquired, as the name suggests, patient ends up with kidney injury while his stay in the hospital. And this is, but this is not as seen uh, as common as the community acquired uh, uh, renal insult. But having said that, mortality, on the other hand, has a greater relationship with advancing age and severity, meaning as the age advances or increases uh, and, and, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, more uh, severe the uh, renal insult, patient ends up with uh, acute kidney injury uh, or rather uh, patient has higher rates of mortality. Now, uh, acute kidney injury, uh, once we've understood what it means, it's defined by the akin and rifle criteria which we need to know. So before we regard a patient to have developed acute in kidney injury, we have to see which criteria, which where in this criteria will the patient fall under. So akin, uh, these are two different criteria, akin criteria and rifle criteria. Akin, basically, it divides the acute kidney injury severity as stage one, two, and three, whereas rifle is a mnemonic that stands for risk, injury, failure, loss, and end-stage renal disease. So that's rifle, and this is akin stage one, two, and three. So what is risk and stage one as described by akin and rifle criteria. It is basically increase in the serum creatinine 1.5 times the baseline or more than 0.3 milligram per deciliter over a span of about two days. And when we talk in terms of GFR, it has to decrease by 25 to 50% to fall under this category. And we have two other issues that we take into consideration, urine G GFR and urine output. When you talk about the urine output, it has to be less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour over, for a span of about six hours. Now, all of that falls under stage one as per akin criteria and risk under rifle criteria. Stage two or injury under rifle criteria is wherein the serum creatinine increases two to three times the baseline and GFR decreases by 50 to 75 percent and urine output is 0.5 uh, is lesser than 0.5 ml per kg per hour over a span of for about 12 hours. So when it gets more severe than this, we will end up with stage 3 or renal failure as described by the rifle criteria. Here, serum creatinine is increased more than three times the baseline and there is increase in more uh, or there is increase in more than 4 mg per deciliter of creatinine and uh, acute or there is acute increase in the levels of more than 0.5 milligram per deciliter and when we talk about the gfr it has to fall by more than 75 percent to fall under this category when we talk about the urine output patients should have less than 0.3 milligram uh, ml per kg per hour for a span of about 24 hours or, or it should be completely anuric for a span of about 12 hours now, this is how we categorize. Now, um, this is where akin criteria ends, but um, according to the rifle criteria, the loss and end stage renal disease is wherein there is complete loss of kidney function for over a span of one month. Of over a span of one month, 
and for end stage renal disease patient will require renal uh, replacement therapy for a span of more than three months so this is akin and rifle criteria now what exactly happens so to understand that we need to know what's the function that the kidney performs it is glomerular filtration which is normally 120 ml per minute per 1.73 uh, bodies meter square of the body surface area now with every decade patient loses up to 8 to 10 ml per minute per 1.73 um, meter square body surface area of the uh, glomerular filtration rate and apart from that the other function that the kidney performs is tubular reabsorption and secretion so it basically uh, throws out the toxic wastes from a body and reabsorbs the important uh, minerals and electrolytes so how does it work the glomerular filtration is basically it has a driving force from the glomerular capillary pressure now that is dependent on two things the renal blood flow and the autoregulation so glomerular filtration's driving force is the glomerular capillary pressure so this pressure determines the filtration of the glom uh, uh, performed by the glomerulus and both of that is affected by uh, the renal blood flow and the autoregulation but most importantly it's the renal blood flow so for by whichever causes the renal blood flow gets affected then it naturally you know affects the whole renal function and that's how it ends up with a renal insult so once this is clear and when the patient's kidneys are recovering following an insult restoration of renal blood flow causes recovery so this entity is a very important uh, entity uh, in in maintaining the whole um, renal function so how do you, um, we end up with a renal insult now that's that can be studied under the three major headings the pre-renal acute kidney injury the intrinsic acute kidney injury and the post-renal kidney injury so pre-renal as the name suggests the insult has happened uh, uh, which uh, in the in the body which does not involve the kidneys basically patient ends up with volume depletion because of excessive vomiting diarrhea sweating or there is third space loss or there is capillary leakage um, because of all of those causes whenever there is affection uh, whenever the renal blood flow gets affected uh, pre-renal patient ends up with a pre-renal acute kidney injury so restoration of uh, volume with crystalloid fluids and all of it helps in the recovery so this is one of the most common and also reversible causes of renal insult that we commonly encounter on a day-to-day -day basis so this is because of decreased perfusion that affects the normal kidney now intrinsic acute kidney injury meaning the problem lies with the kidneys so there is the pathological change that happens within the kidney itself so earlier it used to be called as acute tubular necrosis or ischemic necrosis or acute tubular ischemia all of those entities that we come across all of that falls under intrinsic acute kidney injury like um, patient will have a change a pathology uh, the pathology lies in the glomerulus or tubular uh, or in the interstitium or the vasculature everything that's related to the kidney falls under this criteria now post renal aki meaning the pathology doesn't lie within the kidneys but it lies outside of it like post renal so so this covers the obstruction so whenever a patient has a, a, a obstruction of the ureters or the bladder post renal area either secondary to calculi or tumor or a thrombus because of that there is obstruction of urine outflow when that doesn't happen when the urine doesn't flow out of the kidneys freely there is uh, back pressure now that back pressure ultimately affects the kidney leading to renal insult post renal acute kidney injury so once the obstruction gets relieved patient recovers so this is how it's categorized so when we study in in detail about the pre renal failure these are the possible causes that can lead up that can cause acute kidney injury like i mentioned volume depletion a volume depletion that's hypovolemia that is secondary to gastro 
um, it can be because of increased uh, excessive vomiting or diarrhea or because of decreased intake of water and pharmacological diuretics like uh, your furosemide, torosemide, which causes increased diuresis. Third spacing, uh, like we see in cases of burns, fever, sepsis, or um, salt losing nephropathy. Uh, then uh, hypotension again is secondary to your volume depletion. Um, septic was basically in cases of third spacing in, in, in cases of sepsis when you have a septic vasodilation or patient meets with a trauma or any or because of any reason patient has hemorrhage massive hemorrhage which leads to volume depletion as we see here we if there is one thing that we know for certain that all of this causes decreased perfusion to the kidney now which is why it falls under the pre-renal failure Uh, then as far as these drugs are concerned, they also decrease the perfusion as they decrease the uh, uh, GFR. Now, there are these drugs, uh, like we mentioned, they have their own mechanisms as to how they cause a renal insult. As we see, the, 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 the drugs like uh, NSAIDs or um, contrast that we use for uh, radiological images. These, are all, these all cause reduced renal perfusion. And because of this, patient ends up with pre-renal failure. But there are other drugs which directly cause um, damage to the tubular system of the nephrons, like the aminoglycosides, like uh, gentamicin, streptomycin, or amphotericin B, or uh, immunosuppressant agents like uh, cyclosporin or heavy metals, tacrolimus, all of these directly cause toxicity to the tubular system. Rhabdomyolysis is where a patient has uh, a muscle breakdown, like following excessive exertion, like you go running for a, you know, like a uh, undue, unhabituated distances or because of excessive exertion, a second to uh, infection, whenever there is a lot of skeletal muscle that breaks down or in cases of drugs like cocaine alcohol patient ends up again with uh, renal insult and then there is intratubular obstruction uh, though the drugs that cause intratubular obstruction is like acyclovir and chemotherapeutic agents now how do these cause it's basically they are made they're notorious to cause crystal induced nephropathy so that whenever crystals are formed in the tubular system, the nephrons, that's where obstruction happens and it causes both mechanical and inflammatory inflammation of the kidneys. Now, allergic in, uh, uh, nephritis, nephritis, as we know, it's uh, NSAIDs again, or uh, rifampicin, thiazide, all of these drugs cause allergic inflammation in the nephrons. And HUS is another condition which is caused uh, with one of the other causes that uh, uh, lead to HUS is cocaine cyclosporin and those are the other insults. So when we talk about the post obstructive renal failure these can be categorized according to the ages like from the infants up to the adults in any age group which causes obstruction of the ureters of the bladder the post renal bit it leads to post obstructive renal failure like uh, any natal stenosis, calculi, or there is a, a malignancy, tumor that, you know, um, mm, uh, obstructs the urine outflow. Um, all of these because of fibrosis, wherever it obstructs the free flowing outflow of the urine, um, patient ends up with post obstructive renal failure. So once we know about those two entities, the other entity like we described earlier is the intrinsic renal failure, wherein pathology lies within the kidneys, like a glomerulonephritis, just, for, just to state an example. And then uh, how do the patients end up with? So taking history is of utmost importance, and we need to learn about uh, patients other comorbidities because um, patients with uh, diabetes, hypertension or renal artery, previous renal artery stenosis, 
or those with dyslipidemia or existing chronic kidney disease all of these can precipitate uh, renal uh, renal failure so taking a history and comorbidity of a patient uh, becomes a, has a very vital role to play now patients who end up with uremia with because kidneys are not functional enough to get the body rid of uremia those people you excessive urea urea concentration in the body leads to nausea vomiting altered sensorium patient can slip into even coma so all of these are uremic symptoms and patient can have that classical uremic breath also so with these we we get an idea hint that uremia that urea is not getting cleared out of the body possibly secondary to dysfunction of the kidneys now in the pre renal uh, patients because of volume depletion patient ends up with thirst orthostatic light headedness hypotension and all the decreased urine output because body is trying to conserve the uh, 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 fluid and volume depletion signs like signs of dehydration all of these patients present with uh, pre renal failure now causes like we described multiple times in the past it is because of volume depletion endothelial leak or because of third spacing sepsis fever pancreatitis burns all of that so crystal induced nephropathy like we uh, uh, discussed the drugs that cause it like uh, uh, allopurinol or because of calcli uh, there can be uh, obstruction of the intraluminar obstruction which can cause uh, mechanical and inflammatory inflammation which leads to renal uh, compromise and those patients present with flank pain and hematuria Uh, uh like your calcli patients um then uh, pharyngitis and cutaneous infection can or uh, those the people who present with a past history of within a week or two history of pharyngitis and cutaneous infection and if they land up to the er now with darkening uh, with with dark colored urine and edema with or without the other symptoms like fever fatigue rashes and then we have to think of acute glomerulonephritis because this entity generally has a history of a preceding um, pharyngitis or cutaneous infection and now they would have end up with uh, granular sediments pigmented granular casts in the urine which leads to dark urine and because of retention of fluid it leads to edema third spacing now uh, when we are talking about acute interstitial nephritis wherein the uh, interstitium of the glomerulus is affected again this falls into the intrinsic kind of acute kidney injury and those patients end up with fever arthralgia and rash uh, then uh, those with respiratory component like cough dyspnea and hemoptysis along with renal issues then we'll have to think of good pasteur syndrome and vesnes granulomatosis and then when we suspecting how but when elderly patients come or those with the uh, uh, elderly male patients or those with malignancies like carcinoma prostate or prostatitis or any of the other prostatic diseases and those patients will have to think of post renal failure because of obstruction to the urine outflow and that uh, we see maybe got to suspect more in cases of advancing age and those with indwelling bladder catheters because they cause obstruction and uh, if a patient has ended up with acute retention of urine or anuria complete anuria then in that case also we have to suspect post renal failure especially in uh, elderly males then how do we go about with a clinical examination we'll have to first assess and uh, correct the volume status because like i mentioned most of the patients that land up in the hospital is because of pre renal failure and that second rate to volume depletion so we first have to see uh, how much fluid um patient is deficient and so we have to give adequate amounts and uh, amount of iv fluids uh, so that we don't overcorrect and push the patient to fluid overload status so there are other entities that can hint towards hypovolemia apart from hemodynamics like your hypotension urine output can hint towards decreased urine output can hint towards hypovolemia now other entities are base deficit uh, hypoperfusion which causes increase in the lactate levels the fall in central venous pressure 
and oxygen saturation and uh, ultrasound is basically uh, wherein we put the probe and we check the uh, collapsibility of the uh, inferior vena cava. So if at all inferior vena cava has more than 50% of collapsibility then or it's a kissing inferior vena cava then we say that the patient is volume depleted in that case we can push in fluids. But if the IVC is dilated and it's less than 50% collapsibility and the patient has signs of fluid overload, in that state, we, we best avoid giving additional fluids. And then this becomes at most important, especially if a patient has an underlying comorbidity which involves heart, like cardiac dysfunctions. So in that case, we really do not want to, you know, uh, give more fluids and push the patient to uh, pulmonary edema or fluid overload state. Now we also examine the whole of the body to check for any rashes, any signs of vasculitis. If the patient has uh, um, signs of other organ involvement like ictus, or if the patient has any pelvic masses, any signs for malignancy, uh, or if the patient has acute retention of urine wherein there is post-renal obstruction and the patient has ended up with uh, distended bladder which can be palpated. All of these thorough physical examination is mandatory uh, to find the cause for uh, acute kidney injury. And in, while we are having the cardiac examination, we'll have to look for any arrhythmias like AF or any aneurysms. All of these, the idea is atrial fibrillation again causes thrombus. Um, and if then thrombus can get dislodged, then the emboli can basically obstruct the uh, vasculature of the kidneys, which again leads to hyperperfusion and acute kidney injury and aneurysms, signs of heart failure. Now, signs of heart failure, again, patient can end up with hyperperfusion. And here, in that case, we'll have to be excessively careful so that we do not give um, more fluids to the patient. And of course, we got to palpate the peripheral pulses uh, to, to determine the volume status of the patient. And the patient has a bounding pulse, feeble pulse, all that. So how do we diagnose uh, acute kidney injury? Then in that case, we'll have to discuss what exactly are we aiming for. So um, we have to identify patients who are at a risk of acute kidney injury. Now risk meaning it involves everything right from the history to the patient's uh, um, presentation and comorbidities like patient if at all, like I mentioned, if the patient has comorbidities of like a, a chronic kidney disease in the past or this patient has CLD, chronic liver disease or congestive heart failure issues, coronary artery disease, dyslipidemic, patient is obese, diabetic, hypertensive, all of these uh, predispose the patient uh, to have acute kidney injury. So we have to identify the major risks and then uh, also take into consideration with what complaints the patient has presented with. Has he presented with hematuria, flank pain, or does he have rashes, fever, or decreased urine output, or he's not able to pass urine, difficulty voiding. All of these histories has to be taken into consideration and the physical examination, like we mentioned, wherein we check for patient's volume uh, status and also look for the possible causes for kidney injury. So all of that is falls under identifying the patients who are at risk. Now, then the other thing is we have to correct any metabolic defects that the patient has landed up with. Generally, whenever there is acute kidney injury, patient has uh, decreased uh, excretion of kidney uh, potassium, which leads to increase in the potassium levels. Now that is extremely fatal as hyperkalemia, like we all know, has a direct effect on uh, cardiac uh, function and it leads to uh, cardiac arrest also. In fact, hyperkalemia is one of the reversible causes for cardiac arrest. So all of the metabolic uh, uh, changes that we see secondary to kidney injury that has to be identified and corrected, including acidosis, metabolic acidosis. Then um, we also decrease the ongoing renal injury, like when a patient has ended up with sepsis, we treat sepsis. If the patient has ended up with any volume depletion secondary to excessive vomiting or diarrhea or excessive uh, sweating, we give crystalloids. You know? So we have to decrease the ongoing insult and also stop the nephrotoxic drugs that the patient has possibly been on and also avoid further uh, injury by preventing uh, 
uh, or rather by preventing the prescription of nephrotoxic drugs. So we should avoid at all cost iatrogenic injury uh, of the kidneys. And then we see which major umbrella does the insult fall under. So is it a prerenal cause secondary to volume depletion and decreased perfusion? Is it because of any obstruction uh, um, in the post-renal um, post uh, tract? Or is it the intrinsic pathology that lies within the kidneys? So we have to identify the cause and that's how we diagnose acute kidney injury and see whether it fits in our akin and right way criteria. So what are the investigations that we do? CBC is to rule out any uh, 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 infections in the total counts or because of, uh, uh, so, we, so it's one of the major uh, things that can hint towards a possible infection or if the patient has ended up with hemorrhage and there is fallen uh, hematocrit value and hemoglobin, all of that information we can get from complete blood count. ACG is to rule out any signs of arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation or if um, because of um, uh, if the patient has any signs of heart failure on ECG, like low voltage complexes and all of that, ECG or signs of hyperkalemia, all of that ECG plays a very important role, especially if we see uh, uh, raised or rather deranged RFT, then in that case, ECG is very important to take because we need to see if the patient has any signs of hyperkalemia on the ECG. The other priority is sodium and potassium levels, uh, LFT to see if there is uh, derangement of the liver functions also. Then urine analysis and urine analysis will look for um, the color of the urine, the pH, osmolarity, then whether the patient has any casts, um, granular pigmented casts, saline casts, uh, any proteins. Uh, glucose levels or patient has any positive urine ketones in case of volume depleted states all of that information we or or if there are any signs of infection with bacteria being present nitrites being positive or uh, puzzles patient has significant puzzles and hematuria microscopic hematuria all that information we get through our urine analysis now urine osmolarity already we discussed and urine sodium is uh, generally patients ends up with hyponatremia so we also need to check how's the urine uh, sodium levels is if, uh, if mo more urine sodium is present that again it points towards renal uh, dysfunction and then we collect the cultures when we're suspecting sepsis in case of urinary tract infection cystitis or pyelonephritis and then if a patient then we can also do a bedside uh, uh, ultrasound wherein we check for the residual volume so the post void bladder residual volume uh, gives a hint towards whether this patient has ended up with post renal failure or not because if there is obstruction to the urine outflow then there will be retention of the urine which causes uh, uh, distended bladder and all of that will suggest um, post renal obstruction or renal failure and chest radiography is only to see for any signs of pulmonary edema, fluid overload state, any effusion, pneumonia causes for sepsis. All of that information we get when we do a chest radiography. And renal and ultrasound has a very important role where we see corticomedullary differentiation, any obvious etiology like the patient has any calculi or um, the perinephric fat which uh, can hint towards pyelonephritis hydroureteronephrosis in case of obstruction, all of that information we can get by doing the renal ultrasound. So um, other investigation that is of use is a color Doppler, uh, color flow Doppler ultrasound, which gives, an, uh, which gives an idea about the renal perfusion and can also diagnose any large vessel uh, etiology of renal failure. Now there is something called as resistive index which is nothing but a ratio difference of the systolic flow, renal blood flow to the uh, uh, difference between the systolic flow of the kidney with the uh, diastolic flow and that is divided with systolic flow. Now this uh, gives an entity resistive index. It's a, like, I'll repeat again, it's a ratio difference between the systolic flow and the diastolic flow to the kidneys to 
the systolic flow to the kidneys. Now, this resistive index again gives the insight on the perfusion, uh, renal perfusion. So, in the vasoconstrictive phase, uh, because of the renal uh, ischemic renal failure, in this there will be absolutely no diastolic flow. So, the ratio can be as high as 1. So, whenever there is vasoconstriction, there will be no diastolic flow. So, this entity goes away and the ratio becomes 1. So, that again signifies uh, a hampered renal perfusion. The normal ratio is less than 0.7. Now, creatinine, again, uh, it is one of the major uh, uh, entity that we take into consideration uh, for measuring the renal function. And it is a protein. It is basically a byproduct of the breakdown of a skeletal protein called as creatinine. So, that's from that creatinine, creatinine is taken and uh, it is used to determine the renal function as it gets cleared from the kidneys. Now, creatinine clearance from the Cogra uh, formula, it is used to estimate the glomerular filtration rate. Now, then there is other uh, entity called as a BUN, that is blood urea nitrogen. Uh, we take uh, that also into consideration because this ratio of blood urea uh, nitrogen to creatinine that again is another indicator of hypovolemia. So how does that work is basically both creatinine and urea gets um, filtered uh, from the, uh, they're present as a filtrate in the glomerulus. Now creatinine on the other hand, it stays in the tubule. Whereas urea, it is uh, highly permeable at the tubules and it gets rapidly reabsorbed along with the sodium. So in cases wherein there is sodium retention, urea reabsorption doesn't happen so in that case we uh, we get an in, we we get a clue that the patient is uh, uh, having a kidney injury secondary to volume depletion so if the patient has a normal concentrating ability in a se setting of a pre renal failure wherein a uh, patient has ended up uh, uh, with renal failure secondary to volume depletion and not because of intrinsic kidney pathology. In that case, the ratio is 10. So it means to say with every rise in creatinine, blood urea nitrogen value increases by more than 10. So in that case, we say that it is possibly secondary to hypovolemia that the patient has ended up with renal failure. Now there's other thing called as a fractional excretion of sodium that is the phena but uh, the, we don't really use it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis because this has a lot of uh, other parameters which play which can affect the normal uh, value of the of this entity but it is also another indicator of hypovolemia wherein we take a uh, ratio of uh, urine sodium with plasma sodium and then we divide it with the ratio of urine creatinine and plasma creatinine. And now once we know that the patient has ended up with kidney injury and we have able to uh, identify the risk, the comorbidities, the history and we have done a thorough um, physical examination and tried every possible investigation in order to find out the cause uh, of kidney injury and we have categorized it under the three major headings of pre-renal, renal and post-renal failure and then the treatment becomes pretty simple as we just uh, identify the cause and we treat the cause. So in a critically ill patient, resuscitation is, of, is obviously our major priority and then we find out the cause for when the patient is stable, we find out the possible etiology for acute kidney injury. So we identify and treat hypovolemia and we treat the underlying causes of volume depletion. So how do we treat hypovolemia? It's through crystal or IV fluids. And if the patient is in shock, we resuscitate the uh, patient with 30 ml per kg IV bolus. We look for, uh, we assess the volume status of the patient with IV see with lactate levels, hemodynamics, urine output, and then we give, uh, we calculate the fluid deficit in a patient, and then we give uh, fluids accordingly. And then, uh, like I mentioned, uh, accurate determination of the volume status is important. It's in fact, all the more important if the patient has cardiac dysfunction because we don't really want to push the patient towards fluid overload state. So what happens when a patient has a fluid overload state? 
and has presented to the patient and then the, and we when we see that the patient has acute kidney injury in that case we got to realize whether this uh, is because of volume depletion or not because even in fluid overload state patients can be fluid depleted because the there can be decreased volume intravascular volume so in that case uh, basically in your third spaces um with patients with cld or congestive heart failure it, there is a uh, uh, third space loss happening so in that case patient can be volume depleted in that case we give fluids and we also give diuretics that's how we treat uh, uh fluid overload state and if the patient is going into hypotension then uh, early start of vasopressors is the key mainstay so um then we also stop uh the ongoing insult and prevent iatrogenic injury so in that case all the drugs that can affect the uh, um, renal function so we uh, uh, adjust the dose according to the creatinine clearance and all the nephrotoxic drugs are best avoided so um we make sure that the renal dose adjustments are made for medication orders for prescriptions and we um assess the renal function before we take the patient for any contrast radiographic studies so uh, with gfr of less than of, of between 30 to 60 uh, ml per minute per uh, 1.73 body square uh, surface area we weigh whether it is really necessary to take the patient for an iv contrast study like in cases of aortic aneurysm like basically your dissection area uh, or pulmonary embolism very all the areas where it is absolutely mandated like it can save the life of a patient in that case we we weigh the risk versus benefit and if benefit increases uh, is more than the risk outweighs the uh, uh, risk in that case those with gfr between 30 to 659 we take them for iv contrast study but if it is less than 30 then we avoid iv contrast until and unless it's absolutely mandated as a life threatening as a life saving measure and less than 30 we do not we also avoid giving uh, gadolinium which is a contrast used for mris again all of this because it increases the risk of fibrosis now how do we treat post renal cause once we we suspect post renal uh, pathology in uh elderly males or those with prostatic diseases or complete anuria where we are suspecting any bladder outlet obstruction distended bladder and that calculate in all of those patients for timely relief of obstruction helps in retention of uh renal functions and then permanent loss of renal function develops over a course of 10 to 14 days because of complete obstruction so in that case if a patient has complete obstruction then it takes 10 to 14 days of complete obstruction before permanent loss of nephron sets in and the risk of permanent re uh, renal failure it increases significantly if the obstruction is again complicated by urinary tract infection because there is you just don't have a post renal cause you have a it's complicated with a pre renal cause also so uh, this is how we go about with uh, renal failure post renal failure so when you talk about the intrinsic failure where in the pathology lies within the kidneys in that um uh, we we treat as per the diagnosis like we treat glomerulonephritis separately or if the uh, acute interstitial nephritis all of those um uh, 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 pathologies we we deal individually now renal dose or basically low dose of dopamine that is less than 5 microgram per, per kg per minute and that it does not improve renal recovery and it is proven to not decrease mortality so this is a previous concept that the renal dose of dopamine helps decrease mortality which now the latest studies show that it is not true instead there's another drug called as um, phenoldopam now it's a very potent dopamine d1 agonist so, so it's a selective agonist so it increases the blood flow to the renal cortex and the outer medulla and uh, it decreases the systemic blood pressure basically it is used in cases of hypertensive emergencies and urgencies 
So it reduces the mortality and it provides renal protection in case of critical patients and those who are at risk of renal failure. And because it is titrable like the uh, uh, NTG, it, and it also reliably co controls severe hypertension, hypertension, it is the drug of choice in hypertensive emergencies with renal dysfunction. So then we have the venodilators like uh, NDG and dialysis, and these are best used in cases of volume overload. And diuretics will again be helpful in case of volume overload states, like patient who presents with nephrogenic pulmonary edema. The treatment is uh, no different than any other pulmonary edema, wherein patient, we go again with ABC. Uh, we secure the airway, make sure the patient's airway is patent, if patient has increased work of breathing and severe respiratory distress, we apply a positive pressure ventilation uh, with BiPAP or non-invasive ven ventilation uh, unless and until there are any contraindications. And once we have dealt with that bit, we start the patient with diuretics. So that, that's how we deal with flu volume overload state. But a high dose furosemide, it can cause ototoxicity and studies have proven that there is no benefit in patients who have acute kidney injury, if at all, you know, it's not like you you, you give more, more doses or higher doses of furosemide, patient recovers. There is no benefit for patients with acute kidney injury. They have a high dose furosemide. I'm not just talking about furosemide. Now, calcium channel blockers and mannitol also have no role in the treatment of acute kidney injury. Now, we talk about uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. So this again, uh, like I said, it, it, it causes kidney injury. So you cannot really, we have to first assess the renal function before we take the patient for any uh, contrast studies. And again, like I mentioned, we have to always uh, uh, weigh the risk versus benefit ratio before we plan on taking the patient for uh, IV contrast. So we identify the risk. Uh, we do not uh, start the co-administer any nephrotoxic drugs. We provide adequate hydration. Now, this I cannot stress this enough. What how important it is to adequately hydrate the patient who are at risk both before and after the test. This before and after hy hydrating the patient is one of the major uh, uh, way with which we can prevent. Uh, IV contrast nephropathy and then there is sodium bicarbonate and then we withhold any uh, withhold metformin in case of diabetics uh, and then there are roles of n acetyl system which is not proven hence it is not recommended sodium bicarbonate previously they didn't say they said that there is no much of a role but later studies have shown that it is preferable over giving like Sodium bicarbonate infused IV fluids are better than just normal saline. Uh, so these are the ways with which we could decrease the risk of contrast induced nephropathy. Uh, sodium bicarbonate, it is given as a dose of 3 ml per kg bolus and it is a bolus of a solution of 154 millimoles of per liter of sodium bicarbonate that we mix with 5% dextrose. Uh, now these are the indications for dialysis that's the renal replacement therapy. Uh, dialysis emergency or with, in which conditions do we perform emergency dialysis as a mode of treatment that is uncontrolled hypokalemia. We have given all hypokalemic measures and the patient still has uh, dangerously high levels of potassium levels or there is persistent hypoxia because of fluid overload state that is in nephrogenic pulmonary edema. A uh, patient has ended up with uremic complications like pericarditis, a patient has slipped into coma, or there is progressive uremic metabolic encephalopathy, like a um, patient has ended up not just with pericarditis, but also has altered sensorium asterisks, or patient is throwing seizures or going into or slipping into coma. In all these uremic complications, it's best that we dialyze the patient. 
or if the patient has gone into severe hyponatremia with sodium levels falling less than 115 or severe hyponatremia, basically metabolic uh, uh, derangements, including severe metabolic acidosis, because if you do not treat these right away, patient can end up with uh, arrhythmias and can uh, have um, cardiac arrest. So life-threatening poisoning, which but it has to be with a dialysable drug, not a heavy metal, um, like lithium, aspirin, methanol, theophylline, all of these are dialysable drugs. So when a patient comes with poisoning of with any of these uh, uh, dialysable drug uh, and, and has ended up, uh, so that's a life-threatening uh, poisoning, then we go with emergency dialysis. Our patient has bleeding dyscrasia, but in, like I said, it's another uremic complication and excessive bun to creatinine ratio and uh, patient has worsening renal function and uh, it, it is not treatable with whatever that we are uh, providing the patient with. We have corrected the fluids, but regardless of everything, the patient has falling renal function. In that case, we go for dialysis. So these would be the indication for dialysis. So uh, to sum up, basically acute kidney injury is wherein there is deterioration of uh, renal function, which leads to accumulation of toxic wastes. And uh, that again causes further insults to the kidneys. Now, what happens is uh, whenever nephrons get affected, um, uh, the other nephrons in the recovery phase, the other nephron reserve, they start working extra, like, you know, they, they become hypotrophic in order to compensate for the uh, injured nephrons until these nephrons uh, become better. Now, what happens is, uh, this is the body's way to recover from acute kidney injury. But again, it depends on the nephron reserve. If at all nephron reserve outweighs the, uh, or a nephron reserve is very little and the injured nephrons are too much, in that case, patient will end up with uh, falling uh, uh, or deranged renal function despite recovery. So this is why, this is how patient end up with delayed mortality following recovery from acute kidney injury. So it, ha it has to be majorly classified as pre-renal, renal and uh, post-renal failure. We identify the cause. Majorly it is a pre-renal failure secondary to decreased perfusion to the kidney. So, uh, and that's because of the volume depletion. In that case, we check the, uh, we assess and identify the volume status of the patient and then we correct accordingly. And um, so, so we identify the cause of each of these entities and we um, uh, um, uh, diagnose and this is how we're going to treat the acute kidney injury. So this is it. Thank you.